Welcome to today's GNCC Espresso Live with our distinguished guest, the Acting Medical Officer of Health for the Niagara Region, Dr. Herji. Dr. Herji, thank you so very much for being with us. It's always wonderful to have you. And to all of our participants, glad that you have been able to join us. My name is Mishka Balsam, and I will be your moderator for the next hour. Throughout the pandemic, we have learned that change is ever constant. And these past four weeks have been no different. Since our March Espresso Live, a number of factors have changed. In Ontario, we have seen an increase in COVID-19 cases, and with that, an increase in hospitalization and those in intensive care. Ontario's third largest teachers union, the OECTA, called on the Ford government to reinstitute mandatory masking for schools because teachers' and students' absences due to COVID-19 are causing disruptions to the learning environment. Some of Ontario's top doctors have issued strong recommendations to continue mask use, but not mandated. And when it comes to hospitals, medical clinics, long-term care homes, and public transit, the Ontario government has said that mask mandates in this category will lift on April the 27th, effectively putting an end to the requirement across the province. And as we mentioned previously, Paxlovid, an antiviral drug for treatment of COVID-19 made by Pfizer, was approved in Canada earlier this year. And the province has now announced who can be tested and assessed for antivirals, meaning that pharmacies have started dispensing it. And with that in mind, I thank you all for being here with us to get a better understanding of our current situation here in Naga, our case count, a vaccination update, and what to expect and how to best move forward in a safe way. Many of you have provided us with questions in advance, and please know that we are committed to getting to all of them. If you wish to enable live transcript, please refer to the bottom of your Zoom screen for that option. And if you experience any difficulties, any technical difficulties, if you can utilize the chat function, we most definitely will see your comments coming in and are here to help you out. But starting out, Dr. Hirji will provide us with an update. And followed by that, we will have our Q&A session getting to all of your questions. And on that note, I'm going to move the webinar over to you, Dr. Hirji, for your review. Thank you so much, Mishka. And thank you again to the GNCC for having me here. So hopefully you have these slides up and everyone can see that. Mishka's yes. nodding great. And so let's get started here. So, I, you know, I started off, I think, last time with this slide, which kind of shows a spectrum of how COVID-19, um, you know, evolves in a person. So there's, of course, a transmission event where it goes from one person to another. That person, unfortunately, may develop infection. From there, they may develop serious illness, and then eventually they could get to a serious outcome. And we can try and detect the infection across the various steps around here. Obviously, the further we're to this end, the earlier we're going to see the outcomes. At this end, it's going to take longer before we see outcomes. Uh, and so on this end, of course, if we're looking at wastewater data, we can get a sense of transmission and a sense of how many people are infected. Of course, our PCR cases, which used to be the best way of detecting infection, are still an option, but only a minority of people are able to get PCR tested. The percent positivity, the percent of people who get a PCR test who have symptoms who then end up positive can also be an indicator. And then the number of outbreaks we have can be an indicator of how many infections there are. If you have more infections out in the community, there's more people who are visiting or working in a facility where an outbreak could then start. Uh, serious illness, we can look at our hospital and ICU numbers. And as Mishka mentioned, some of those are unfortunately increasing. And then the most serious outcomes at the end are, of course, things like long COVID and deaths. We unfortunately don't have good data on long COVID and who's being diagnosed with it, but we do have some data on deaths that we can look at. And I'll again kind of work through this spectrum going along here to see how things are evolving at the, both the provincial level and then in uh, Niagara itself. So this is the wastewater data for the province. You can see this was our Omicron wave back in January. We fortunately came down, didn't quite get all the way down the way we were before that wave. And of course, we've seen another wave now as we are going up. 
this preliminary data you can see is maybe hopeful that we might be at a point where there could be a bit of a decrease, but I caution that it's the only the preliminary part that's decreasing is still increasing when we have our complete data. I'm also mindful that you can sometimes see dips and then they will uh, rise back up, but we're all of course hoping that we are perhaps coming closer to a peak of this wave and it's going to start to go up. But nonetheless, it has been going up for quite a while. And this is the earliest indicator. So cases, um, hospitalizations, ICU death uh, and deaths, those are going to keep going up for a while because the shadow of this onto those hasn't yet arrived. The other caution I have here is while it's you know, looking like it might be hitting a plateau or starting to come down at a province-wide province level, that's not the case for the entire province. And when we break this down, we can see here that the central east area, which is basically the area north of the GTA, eastern Ontario here, and then us here, in the, which is the central west region, we are still going up even in that preliminary data. It's only some parts of the province that might be showing signs that they are starting to plateau a bit. And I think we need to be mindful that not everybody's experience if the pandemic is going to be uniform across the province. So in terms of then our PCR confirmed cases, um, you can see here that we have been going up. There is a little dip, which has been entirely actually due to this long weekend. So I'm not yet willing to trust that this is actually a true decrease so much as people over the long weekend having less ability to get tested. So we've seen for the last couple of days that the testing numbers have gone back down. We'll need to see over the next few days if this uh, comes back up or if maybe we start to see some element of uh, it trending back down. I saw a question just came in that why do they call it wastewater? And it's basically, it's the water that we flush down our drains or flush down our toilets as waste and that goes to wastewater treatment plants. And so in Niagara, it's actually at our wastewater treatment plants where we are going into that sewage and actually testing it for are there signs of the virus there. Um, part of what the virus does is when it infects us, it actually comes out in the human waste that we pass down our toilets. So that hopefully answers that question. Uh, so these are the cases in Ontario. You know, a little dip, I just I think mostly because of the long weekend. We'll see what develops over the next few days. When we look at the percent positivity data, this is that orange line here for percent positivity. We can see that that is still trending up. So that hasn't yet shown a sign that our infections have crested. When we look at our hospital numbers, predictably, these are going up because our infections are still going up. Our ICU numbers, fortunately, have not gone up by very much. They've gone up a little, but this is actually a good sign. And is perhaps a sign that actually the vaccine might be preventing people from ending up at that ICU level and actually keeping the people who do end up very sick only at a level of being hospitalized. The science table released their modeling on Thursday of what we can see going forward. And as you can see here, they are predicting that we're going to see hospitalizations continue to go up until sort of the early part of May is when they're predicting there might be a peak. Uh, and you can see in their most pessimistic scenario, we could end up with hospitalizations higher than they were through the Omicron wave. Though there are some more optimistic scenarios and we're all hoping, of course, we'll end up with one of those. But I think it should be mindful that this could be a relatively bad wave still as it's coming. Of course, taking the context that when we went through this wave, we were in a kind of a lockdown where we had a lot of uh, businesses closed. There was extensive capacity limits. Whereas now we're not really doing a whole lot to prevent COVID-19. And so we might end up with a wave as large as the previous one, but in the absence of actually doing a lot of things. And again, that's probably a sign that the vaccine and the third doses we did in the last few months are going to mean that we can actually be nearly completely open and still actually not see a completely massive surge of hospitalizations. The modeling for ICU numbers, kind of the same kind of story. You know, there's a possibility we could see a similar number to the last wave, but there's also some more optimistic scenarios. Looking then at the severe outcome that we might see with COVID-19, which is uh, the death being the one we can actually measure, we can see that we did see an uptick in deaths last week. It has dipped the last few days, and again, I think this might be uh, less reporting because of the holidays. We'll see where that goes. And even before we, you know, went into starting to see that increase, 
our deaths had not come down to where they were in the summer and fall of last year, or you know, preferably where we were the summer previous to that, where we're getting close to zero at times. And so I would like to ideally see us get that number much lower here before we um, move on and get past this pandemic. So I'll shift over to looking at Niagara now, and we'll look at the Niagara um, wastewater data. And so this is the Port Weller wastewater treatment plant in St. Catharines. And you can see here, you know, it's kind of noisy data. It's not consistent, but you can see there's been a definite increase here. Uh, maybe not to these, you know, couple days of the very peaks we had back in the January wave, but we're actually not too dissimilar from some of the uh, numbers where we're seeing in that previous wave. If you go to the Niagara Falls wastewater treatment plant, this is actually even higher where we're getting very close to actually where we were in that previous wave, you can see. Taking a look here then at Welland, we can see again, there's been a big increase in detections of virus in the wastewater there as well. And then finally, the 40 year wastewater treatment plant, you can see some you know, big increases in detection and actually an all time high on this date here, which is just earlier uh, this month. As I mentioned, you know, these numbers do jump up and down a bit, so I wouldn't put too much stock into that one time being that high. But nonetheless, the fact they were that high, I think is consistent with we are hitting, you know, very high levels of infection spreading right now based on the wastewater. Our PCR confirmed cases very similar to the Ontario story. We've, you know, been going back up a little bit of a dip, which is, I think, probably due to the long weekend. Our percent positivity, you can see, is steadily trending upwards. So like the province, we have not seen any change there. We can take a look at the number of outbreaks we've had here in Niagara, and you can see the number of outbreaks we have are going up, which is consistent with more people out in the community getting infections and then visiting or working in these facilities and starting an outbreak there. Our hospital numbers here in Niagara, and this is with Niagara Health, you can see the number of people hospitalized with COVID-19 is steadily trending upwards. Like the province though, the ICU number is fortunately pretty flat, and that's I think good news. But that you know, hospitalized, hospitalization number going up is I think reflected here, where if we look at the average number of new people being hospitalized every day, um, you can see that we were lower for a period and then that has gone up. And we're in the one and a half to two people being hospitalized per day. And of course, if more people are being hospitalized per day, that's gonna drive that trend I just showed you of more hospitalizations overall. And I think what is a little worrying to me is that when I look at the number of acute care beds occupied in Niagara, you can see that our hospitals remain, you know, over capacity right now. And actually you can see that we've been pretty consistently hitting at 100% or exceeding that for close to six or seven months at this point. So I think that is a big strain on our hospitals and that is concerning to me of how much longer they're able to maintain being over capacity like this going forward. Finally, here are the deaths that we've seen in Niagara. And fortunately, we are not really seeing any strong sense that we're seeing more people dying of COVID-19 here yet. Deaths are the last thing to go up. Of course, on that continue I showed you where we started with transmission and had serious outcomes at the end. So the last thing we see are the serious outcomes, but fortunately we're not yet seeing an increase in deaths. So that's definitely a little bit of good news that we have here. So I think overall, you know, Ontario, Niagara, we're seeing more infections. We're seeing more people hospitalized. Uh, at least in the Ontario data, we're seeing more people passing away, not so much here in Niagara maybe some early signs that we might be hitting the crest of the wave, but I think we need to still see a little bit longer to see what's happening. And you know, one of the reasons why we're, I think, experiencing this wave comes down to the variants that we're dealing. And unfortunately, this is a very complicated graph, so I'm gonna walk you through it. So this dark blue here, this is the alpha variant, and this is going back to where we were in 2021. Sorry, my video just has died on me here for a second. Um, so back in early 2021, we had the alpha wave. And so that's this dark blue here. And you can see, you know, in the middle part of that year, we had this sharp decline in alpha as this green and this pink really took over. And the green and the pink are really just sub-variants of the delta wave. 
And then we have this light green, this light purple, light blue. And these are actually just other subvariants of the delta wave or delta variant. And so we had the alpha variant, which was outcompeted by the delta variant. And then the delta variant basically took over and it was 100% of what we're dealing with and just broken down into a few different subvariants. End of last year, we hit this point where Omicron comes on the scene. And orange and yellow are two different subvariants of Omicron. And you can see they basically outcompete Delta variant. They basically push Delta aside and take over. And basically now almost everything is Omicron. And then most recently, we had the BA2 subvariant, which seems to be outcompeting the other two subvariants of Omicron and taking over. And you can see that it's now, you know, as of this period, which is a couple of weeks ago, it's on the order of something like 60 plus percent of our infections in Ontario are the BA2 variant. And the BA2 subvariant is outcompeting because it's able to spread more easily. It's also a little different in that it's um, better able to reinfect us a little bit. And so unfortunately, a lot of the people who got infected with Omicron in January, February, some of them are getting reinfected now with this BA2 subvariant because it's able to get around some of the immunity that we may have developed from infection or from the vaccine previously. Now, that's not happening to everybody. It's only a proportion of people, but nonetheless, it is a bit of a challenge. And that is why I think we're partly seeing more infections. We have a subvariant that is spreading more easily. So it's spreading to more people. It's able to reinfect people. And of course, we don't have a lot of our protections left in society. We've, of course, really opened up everything, which is, I think, what we wanted to do. But we're no longer doing the th things like having masks. People aren't practicing physical distance anymore. Taking away all of those measures is, I think, decreasing our ability to keep the virus under control, which is why we're seeing some of those trends that I showed earlier. Um, just want to highlight here that, you know, I've shown this before, that we in Ontario and in Canada generally have done pretty well when it comes to this pandemic. If we're looking at the deaths per million population, deaths per capita in this pandemic, we have done better than our friends in Europe and particularly better than the United States. And so hopefully this is something we can try and maintain in the coming months. You know, we've done so much hard work over two years to keep this low. And I think a lot of people have made big sacrifices to uh, change their lives, had their business affected so we can prevent a lot of deaths. And I'm hoping that we don't lose that in the coming months. One of the challenges, of course, as long as COVID infection remains high, is that people can develop long COVID. And this is a slide from the Ontario Science Table showing all the different kinds of symptoms that people can experience. Unfortunately, I know it's pretty difficult to read this, but quite a number of people, you know, conservative estimates suggest at least 10% of unvaccinated people will develop post-COVID syndrome. Some fraction of people who are vaccinated will develop this post-COVID syndrome and then have some long-term symptoms. The other issue that we're seeing with long COVID is that actually some medical conditions become more likely as a result of these. And so here's actually a set of different cardiovascular illnesses. And it's showing that in someone who has COVID but is not hospitalized, this is how much increased risk they have uh, in terms of having that in uh, this outcome later in life, so a stroke later in life. Orange is the number of people who got hospitalized with COVID-19 and how much more their risk is of having a stroke and people who are admitted to ICU and how much more risk their future risk of a stroke is. And so in the next year, you know, people who underwent this are going to have, you know, a certain number of, you know, out of a thousand, a certain number of them are going to have uh, um, some of these uh, uh, chronic illnesses occur. Just picking up the you know heart failure one here. So you know you can see the heart failure. This is probably about 75. You add up another 45 to it. That's about 120, maybe 125. So you know 125 out of a thousand. That's about a 1.25 percent increase. So 1.25 percent of people who are infected with COVID-19 in the next year are going to develop heart failure by the fact that they had a COVID-19 infection. And then you add in the risk of all of these other things. And so keeping infections down, I think, is really important so we can decrease all of these other health issues long term, which is, of course, going to also be a burden on our healthcare system. So lots of reasons to keep our you know, people uninfected. We prevent deaths. We prevent these serious illnesses. And then, of course, I think something that many of you might be experiencing in your businesses is just the destruction of people being off work because they're sick. 
This is looking actually at acute healthcare workers because there's good data collected on this. And you can see when we go through waves of COVID-19, healthcare workers unfortunately become sick either through their work in the healthcare system, but often actually just by virtue of the fact that they're out and about living their lives and unfortunately getting sick and out in the community. And you can see with each of those, there was an increase in people getting sick with COVID-19, a big increase because of that Omicron wave we had. And you can see we're seeing people off work sick in amongst healthcare workers, similar again to that Omicron wave. And you can actually see that between those waves, we never actually got that number much lower than we were actually in previous waves. So this is actually, I think, another thing that really stresses our healthcare system. But I think this probably stresses our entire economy. When people aren't able to go to work or children aren't able to go to school and we're hearing lots of absenteeism in school or people aren't able to go to university, there's a lot of destruction that happens to our society. And keeping infections down is of course good to make sure that we can actually truly get back to living our normal lives and having our society and economy function as normal by making sure people are healthy enough to be able to keep participating in that. How do we do that? Well, obviously vaccination is one part of that. You know, this is from the science table from last week and showing that if you're vaccinated, you're four, you know, four times less likely to be hospitalized. If you're unvaccinated, four times more likely to be hospitalized than someone with two or three doses, six times more likely to be in ICU than someone with two or three doses. So vaccinating is absolutely one way that we can try and keep people safer and allow our society to get closer to something more to normal. This is what we've seen with our vaccination uptake. These orange bars are first doses, which are pretty high across all age groups, except for our 5 to 11 age group. The blue here are second doses, similarly quite high everywhere. And then the green are our third doses. And we've got good uptake of third doses in our eldest group, which is important because they're the most likely to be having a severe outcome. But there's a lot more we could do to vaccinate, I think, this 20 to 60 year old age group, as well as young uh, children as well, who are eligible to get that third dose, which is the 12 to 17 year olds. And if we could get this group vaccinated, of course, this means that this group is not able to pass infection on to older members of their life, such as parents, grandparents, maybe teachers, coworkers who are older, which will of course protect these groups but it'll also decrease the amount of people getting sick because they'll be vaccinated and they'll not be spreading infection to others. And I think that you know, getting this group here vaccinated is a real priority and anything we can do to incentivize or nudge this group to get vaccinated, I think gets us closer to being where we need to be as a society. Just highlighting here, you know, the importance of getting that third dose is that this is your protection with two doses in the first three months with three doses, you can see here, it's a bit higher. It's closer to 90% where it's maybe 75%. You can see that protection wanes over time. It's not waning as quickly once you have three doses. And so that three doses is really important and really should be the baseline of protection everybody has. You know, I think it's sometimes people make uh, the concern that because people are still getting sick with COVID-19, even though they're vaccinated, what's the point? And of course, the point is here that even while some people might unfortunately get some symptoms of illness, they're much less likely to be hospitalized, much less likely to be end up in an ICU, much less likely to pass away. But the other part actually is, is this, which is that if you have two doses of vaccine and you get COVID-19, this is a measure of how much virus you have. If you have three doses, this is much how much virus you have in your system when you're infected with COVID-19 despite having three doses. And you can see the amount of virus is much lower. It's basically one-sixth the amount of virus you have. And that's important because that means that you're one-sixth as likely to spread that infection to other people. And so we're substantially protecting everybody still if you get your the third dose of vaccine. You're protecting yourself from hospitalization, ICU, death, even getting infected but you're also protecting other people from getting infection and getting people that third dose, I think is really, really important therefore for us. Just wanna highlight here, you know, long-term care homes were a place where we saw unfortunately enormous amount of death early on in the pandemic. And you can see in our first wave, the risk of dying in, as a long-term care home resident versus someone who's 80 plus years old. Second wave, similarly, a massive increase in your risk of dying as opposed to someone who's otherwise 80 plus years of age. Late, tail end of that second wave and before the third wave, we actually got people vaccinated in long-term care. 
And you can see what the impact of that was, where far fewer people passed away in long-term care once we actually got them that vaccination. We had the fourth wave and the fifth wave where we actually got people third doses before that and started to give fourth doses at that point. Unfortunately, that third wave, first, sorry, fifth wave, the Omicron wave was much bigger. You can see there's more, unfortunately, uh, 80 plus people in the community getting sick than in most of our previous waves. But even then we were able to not have too many more deaths in long-term care homes. Um, and absolutely, I think this is a sign of how important vaccination has been to protecting this most vulnerable group. And of course, if it's protecting them, it can hopefully protect the rest of us as well. Just wanna highlight that the vaccine doses we're administering has unfortunately come to a very low number here in Niagara, even compared to the fall of last year. A little bit of an uptick of late, which is I think people coming out for second boosters who are in that 60 plus age group. I think we really need to find ways to encourage those other people who are willing to get their first two doses to come back and get that third dose so that they have that protection going forward. So vaccination is one of the key things we need to do to get, I think, through this wave and minimize the harm from it uh, and hopefully protect ourselves from the long term as well. One other thing I really believe we should be doing during this wave is all wearing masks again. And I am favoring actually the province would temporarily bring back a mask mandate for this purpose. You know, this is some analysis by the US CDC showing that, you know, if you're wearing a mask, even a you know, cloth mask, which is not very good quality, is more than half cutting your odds of getting COVID-19. Two thirds down, if you're wearing a better quality surgical mask, if you go up to a respirator, you're now, you know, probably five, six, you know, uh, your risk. So you've cut your risk down to one sixth of what it was. So lots of good reasons, I think, to wear masks, to minimize some of the harm that's happening during this uh, sixth wave, both in terms of people getting sick, you know, suffering uh, hospitalizations, but also protecting the most vulnerable people around them as well as keeping kids in school and keeping people able to go to work because they're not sick. I know one of the questions that was asked uh, was, what can public health do to support businesses who wanna maintain a mask policy? So the first thing I've, we've done is we've actually put out a public statement that was in uh, mid-March, really recommending organizations maintain a mask policy. So if you wanna to refer to that policy and say you're following public health guidance as your justification, you can absolutely do that. We've also put up a couple of posters on our website, which you can freely download, print out in color, put up. This one here is for settings where the province is still requiring masking, such as you know, transit uh, locations, for example, or healthcare locations. This is one that's perhaps more relevant to most of you, where if you have a policy or if you just wanna softly encourage wearing masking, you, know, you can put this poster up as a reminder to people to tell them that they should continue to wear their masks. I'm really interested if there are thoughts you have of other things we can do in public health to support your organization with masking. If there are, I would really love to hear your suggestions because we really do want to support you uh, to keep masking policies in place. I think that supports your employees, your customers to stay safe, and it's going to support our entire community to stay safe. One other question that was asked is what do we do then for the long term? You know, vaccination, wearing masks, I think are really important for us right now so we can get through this wave. But I think we've seen that we are gonna keep getting waves of this infection with us. Uh, you know, we, uh, even with, you know, fairly high levels of two doses of vaccines, we went through this next wave. We don't yet have a high level of three doses. We've seen new variants and sub variants emerge. And unfortunately, as long as virus is spreading, it's going to allow those, uh, that virus to keep mutating, new variants to come, and new waves to afflict us. And I talked a bit about this actually two expresses ago, back in the, the February one. And if that recording is still up, you can go back and see a bit more detail on that. But I actually had an op-ed published in the Globe and Mail yesterday, which actually goes into some of those details again. And I'll just quickly review some of what those thoughts are I have. First off is we know this virus transmits through the air. It's a bit of actually, I think, a paradigm shift for us where we thought this virus, like other respiratory viruses, were spreading through droplets, which we maybe breathe out, cough out, and they fall to the ground pretty quickly because they're heavy. We now realize that it's actually in much tighter aerosolized droplets that float in the air for a long period of time. And that's how this infection is spreading and probably how flus and colds and all of those are spreading as well. 
If we improve ventilation, so we take the air in an inside space where a lot of people might be who might be breathing out virus and we're exchanging it with clean air from the outside, that's ventilation. That means we're taking away the risk of people in that area being infected with the virus. We can use filtration where we remove the virus as it recirculates through the system and gets released back into the room. And there are some actually UV devices where you can have you know, UV devices up on the ceiling. Obviously, when we're breathing air out, it's warm. And so actually, when we breathe out, that warm air rises and it takes the virus with it. And if you have UV lights at the ceiling, you can actually disinfect that virus right there. Um, so, you know, I think having big investments by the government to do that is one way we can make all of our indoor spaces safer so that we don't have to worry about COVID-19 as much. Obviously, being outdoors, we know, keeps us safer, and it keeps us safer because outdoor has this natural ventilation. You're in a big, wide open space. That virus that you breathe out can just dissipate. There's a breeze that's going to blow it away. That's going to keep us safer. So if we can maximize things that we do outdoors, that's going to keep us safer. I know the last couple summers, we had, you know, walkable outdoor spaces and streets, you know, especially along shops where there could be shopping. We had, you know, bigger patios for restaurants. I say we should double down on that. We know that's keeping people safer and having more people walking along streets where there's shops or restaurants having more seating can only actually help them serve more people and perhaps even strengthen and help our economy through a bit of a summer period when especially us in Niagara could benefit from the tourism from that. I wanna just take a moment to look at influenza here. Everybody knows we have an influenza wave every year. It looks kind of like this every year. Last couple of years, we haven't really seen an influenza wave because everything we did to stop COVID-19 also stopped influenza. But you'll notice, you know, there's a month every year where we have a peak. And if you look at where that peak is, it's January. Pretty much every year, January is the peak of influenza season. And why is January the peak? Partly it's because influenza is building up in the late fall and the winter. We have our winter holidays. We have lots and lots of family gatherings. Social gatherings is what we do during that period of time. Unfortunately, that probably lets infection spread between us. And then we go back to work. We go back to school. We go back to campus. We're around other people different than we were during the holidays. And now we spread infection to all of them as well. And that basically fuels a big surge in January, which then slowly dies off. I think we can probably expect that is going to happen with COVID-19 then. We're going to see a spike of infections every in January. And frankly, we've had lockdowns the past two January, which is probably not a coincidence. What I would suggest is that we kind of can break that cycle where instead of everybody, you know, having this winter gatherings, which I think we're going to still do, that's an important part of our lives. But after those winter holidays, we don't all go right back to work and school. Can we have a washout period where we maybe have either an extended time off, we rearrange our holiday calendar so people don't go right back to school and work, so we're not spreading infection to a whole bunch more people, and we can see a smaller wave as a result? Or maybe we have a period where everybody works from home, we can work from home, so that we minimize the ability of infection to spread. I think thinking about that winter calendar could be one way we can decrease waves going into the future. And so, you know, another thought I have is to think about that washout post winter holidays. I think if we can keep people home when they're sick, that means they're not going to be spreading infections and we need to continue to have workplace policies that can promote that. And I think having government paid sick days is part of that. So people, especially in the service industry, which is so important in Niagara, don't feel pressured to be at work to go um, earn an income they can feel it's okay for them to be home. They're gonna have the money to pay their bills. And in the process, they're not infecting their coworkers. They're not infecting the customers who are coming into those settings. I think we can reduce inequalities in our society because we've seen the impact of COVID-19 is unequal. So this is actually from the science table last month. And this is showing each of our waves of COVID-19 that happened prior to this most recent one and how many deaths were happening per capita and then looking at neighborhoods by quintile. So quintile one are the lowest income neighborhoods, quintile five are the highest income neighborhoods. And you can see lower income neighborhoods consistently had more deaths than higher income neighborhoods. And it, it was you know, basically a you know, pretty clear gradient here. The higher income you were, the less likely you were to die of COVID-19. And so if we can make our society more equal, we can bring some of these higher numbers down to the same risk as the lower numbers. 
and that will actually lessen the impact of COVID-19 on all of us. And so I think making our society more equal is another way we can protect ourselves from this virus. Just highlighting here that if we look again at the income levels, vaccine uptake, lowest in that lower income quintile, highest in the higher income quintile, you know, there are unequal impacts of, you know, our work to prevent this pandemic across, um, uh, you know, people's income levels and different measures of inequality. And we need to really address to make people more equal. And then lastly, we will have more waves. And I think when waves come back, we should go back to wearing masks, trying to keep some physical distance, screening people before they go into public settings so that we can minimize the risk of infection spreading during those periods of time. If we do this, we can blunt the waves without necessarily going to the real extreme lockdown measures that we've had to do in the past. And I think, you know, with lots of vaccine, with lots more tools to prevent us, hopefully doing all of this, this will be enough to do a little bit additional blunting of the waves to minimize some of the harm and suffering that it brings, while not actually doing things that really are very impactful on our economy and our society. And finally, I just want to, you know, share how you can take some of those lessons to maybe apply to your workplace. So getting vaccines up, really important. The more vaccinated people you have in your workplace, the safer the workplace is going to be. So I recommend keep a vaccination policy in your workplace and incorporate a third dose four to seven months after the second dose. So you can make sure your vaccine policy is aligned with science is going to keep the workplace as safe as possible. To improve ventilation and filtration, make sure your HVAC is continuously running. Use at least a MERV 13 filter if your system can handle that. And that's going to help remove the air and filter out virus that's there. When the weather is good, open windows. That's a form of natural ventilation. And we can actually take measurements of CO2. We, of course, breathe out CO2. If a lot of the air we're breathing out is building up and not being vented out through our ventilation system, we'll see CO2 build up. And that can be a sign that our ventilation is not optimal. So we know that we need to do a bit of troubleshooting to try and improve that. Mask policies, so we keep masks in place when infections are high. So I would right now be maintaining mask policies until infections are lower. And I'd have a policy that you can maybe bring back when levels of infection go high again, we have more surges. We can bring that back as something that protects our workplaces. Talked about we want to make sure we have a culture of staying home if sick, having some sort of self-screening so people check if they have symptoms and they don't come into work if they have symptoms is good. Of course, having any kind of workplace policies to give people sick time so they don't feel compelled to come to work if they're sick is good. And we've all invested in remote work options the last two years. Let's make sure we use this. If people are well enough to work, but they uh, do have some symptoms, like so family members who are sick and they don't want to bring infection in the workplace, let's make it possible for them to keep working, keep contributing to the organization without necessarily contributing any infection to their organization. And then I mentioned a surge protocol where when we do go through waves, we bring back masks, we screen people into coming into our organizations, we encourage physical distance, we maybe do more meetings virtually to reduce that in-person interaction so we can make sure we continue to keep people safe without necessarily having the infection come with it. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Mishka so we can answer some of the additional questions that are Dr. Hoji, thank you so very much for the update. It's always uh, very much appreciated. And I want to also make sure that everyone is uh, looking at uh, the chat and uh, the questions that have come in. Some of the resources have been, uh, have been shared here as well. So uh, please feel free to utilize it. I also want to thank uh, each and every one of you because a high number of questions have come in and we're very much committed to actually getting to all of them. Um, First of all, let me get to a couple of questions that have come in, and I think they're likely are very quickly to answer. One of the ones uh, that has come forward is um, if there will be a change to the definition of fully vaccinated by Health Canada, um, as some uh, workplaces are continuously experiencing um, some situations in their workplace, and I think that might, uh, will there be a change to it, and especially as time goes on? Yeah, I'm hoping there will be. I haven't heard anything directly from Health Canada or the Public Health Agency of Canada, but I think it just makes sense. The best science says three doses is what is actually recommended for anybody age 12 and up. So we want to, you know, update that definition, I think. I just, I'm not sure what they're thinking on it is right now. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you have, in your presentation, you spoke to the increased uh, rise in the number of cases in Ontario 
um, and uh, especially that we have experienced recently, and um, that likely there might be, uh, it hasn't been ruled out that maybe a local masking order or return to vaccine verification will come in place sometime later. But that's not really the question. But in light of those situations, can you tell us what metrics you're looking at that would trigger uh, that kind of decision uh, that you would look at um, for our region or for any of the regions across Ontario? Uh, we're talking here to uh, mainly a business audience, and so metrics are always of uh, key yeah. importance to them. And so they're asking, what are you looking for? Yeah, so, you know, we actually are putting up some thresholds on our website with some of our indicators there of what we look at. We're basically at a point where we're well past those thresholds, which is why I've actually been calling on the province to bring back mandatory masking for a period of time, because I think infection is high enough. We're seeing the destruction of children in school. We're seeing destruction of workplaces in our healthcare system with people being off. I think it's time for it to come back. Um, where, you know, I would act independently of the province, I haven't really defined metrics for that because I think it's less about the health risk at that point and more about how likely are we going to be able to convince the province to take that step. And I, I don't know, you know, how much success we're having right now with that. I haven't yet given up that hopefully we can try and convince them to, to make that step so we can have a consistent rule across the province. Masking is one aspect of it. It's important, but it's only one aspect of it. And businesses are um, concerned about masking, but to a lesser degree uh, than likely when it comes to capacity limits, when it comes to closures and other areas of it. Uh, is there any reassurance um, that those kind of measures is maybe something that we don't need to look at over the next uh, six months? Yes, I can't promise anything over the next six months. I think with this wave, I can't see us going down that road. I think uh, we will manage to get through this wave with difficulty, but that difficulty I don't think is going to get us to the point where we're going to see any kind of capacity limits or closures come back. I would like to see masks come back to reduce some of the suffering, though, from this wave. What could lead to some of those more intense measures like capacity limits in the future would be if there's a new variant that kind of blows everything out of the water again, the way the Omicron variant did in December and early January. And that's unpredictable. I don't know if there'll be a new variant. I suspect at some point there will. Hopefully it won't be one that really changes everything the way it did. The best thing we can do is if we lower the spread of infection, we lower each chance that the virus has to mutate because every time it spreads, it mutates a little bit and we reduce the chance that we're gonna get those variants. Um, and yeah, it is, it's welcomed if it doesn't get to that stage from business. Yeah. It has been, as you can understand, extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, one of our audience members is also asking how dependable are uh, rapid antigen mm -hmm. tests for asymptomatic individuals that are there, especially those ones that are screening it. Many workplaces have put it in place so that they're doing it twice uh, a week. And I also wanted to let everyone know on this webinar that for the past uh, two, two and a half months, uh, we had a very difficult time actually accessing rapid antigen tests. And we now have actually been able to um, receive our supplies again. So if you are interested in actually having those tests available at your workplace, uh, we'll make sure to share a link in the chat function that allows you to sign up for it as well. But uh, to uh, Tara's question. Yeah. So rapid antigen tests aren't perfect. I think we need to acknowledge that. They're probably in the order of, you know, 50, 60, 70% accurate. So there's going to be some people who are infected with COVID-19 and who unfortunately don't test positive. But nonetheless, if your business is doing it, that's, you know, a really good thing. If you pick up 70% of people you might have otherwise missed. So I think it's definitely still a very valuable thing. One thing I'm particularly noticing with a BA2 variant, and actually the science table really seemed to affirm this, is that early on in infection, people don't necessarily test positive with that rapid antigen test. But then you know, two or three days later, they start to test positive. Um, so for an asymptomatic person, you know, I think regularly testing, as you're suggesting, every couple of days is good. You'll eventually pick them up. Unfortunately, you might miss them when they're infectious for a couple of days, uh, but better than nothing. For someone who has symptoms, if they do a rapid antigen test, it might come back negative. And I'd actually really encourage them for a couple of days later to repeat it because actually a couple of days later, all of a sudden it might come back as positive. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and we've heard the same actually from a lot of our employers at the same time too, of actually going forward like this. Uh, we have one of our attendees and they're saying that there's a high number of large events coming up and mm -hmm. I can't understate or overstate and how thrilled people are to actually be together in person again, how it changes the conversation, how important it is, uh, these relationships and for us to nurture those relationships. Uh, for our mental well-being, for our sense of belonging, for so many reasons. So in Niagara, we are fortunate to have a high number of such things coming up. We have the Canada Summer Games, we have Ripfest, we have Grape and Mine and others that are coming forward. And Lenore uh, is asking here, what are your recommendations when it comes to these festivals? Many of them actually taking place in the summertime during the months of July and August. Yeah. So good news with these festivals is that they are largely outdoors and as i mentioned outdoors is a lot safer for not, for not seeing as much covid 19 so i think that right away makes it a lot easier for these to go successfully the bigger risk is going to be in any parties or celebrations that kind of happen around these that's where more of the risk is going to be we're going through a wave right now it'll probably taper off in may and then into early june so I'm hopeful late June, July, August, when the weather is on our side, everybody is doing things outdoors, we may actually have a bit of a reprieve from the virus. And hopefully these events will go off pretty well. Um, you know, key things that I think to pay attention to is those indoor events that are going to happen on the periphery of these and trying to do what reasonable things that we can do to minimize the risk there. I talked about ventilation, filtration, doing those, make sure that nobody who's sick shows up to those events, really encourage them not to come if they're sick. I would say that, you know, uh, while I'm recommending people all wear masks right now, hopefully we're past that, but being of course, you know, open to people who may wanna take that extra level of precaution wearing masks, I think that could be something else you do. But I'm actually fairly hopeful that we'll be able to get through those events this summer without it being too bad. And we're coming back to the uh, vaccination rate. And one of the questions uh, that someone actually had emailed to us prior to this one, our overall vaccination rates are relatively high. But you pointed out in your presentation again, is that group from five to 17, where it's significantly lower than the rest of the population. And then overall, the uptake on the third dose has been lower than that. It has been like this now for a period of time. Um, we looked at it, I think the data in February, we looked at it in March, and we are not seeing significant changes, which I think is an indication that likely some of it, for some individuals will change, but likely there is probably not a significant uptake on it um, without trying to be pessimistic about it, but I think it's likely the case. Um, do you see it the same way or is there anything that um, individuals can do or promotion wise it can be done to uh, encourage more people to get uh, vaccinated? Yeah, so I agree with you. It's really tapered off and it's hard to convince people to get vaccinated. I think part of this is some of the provincial messaging, which I think is really reinforcing a sense that the pandemic is over, which I think given we're in another wave, unfortunately, it's not quite over. We're definitely in a much better place, but it's not over. And I'm not hearing a lot of strong messaging from the province trying to encourage people to get vaccinated. And I think if they did that and they were doing more intense promotion, it could actually make a little bit more of an impact. I don't think we'd see massive numbers, but it could help. I think, as we were just talking a moment ago, the definition of fully vaccinated being two doses creates a little bit of confusion. So it feels like that third dose is for a little bit extra protection rather than actually being necessary for your baseline protection now. And I think we need to update that uh, definition. I think the proof of vaccination tool the province has should be updated to have three doses so that places that are still using it, they can actually set that expectation of three doses. Workplace policies, I'm not sure they've updated to three doses. So I think kind of really level setting with policy measures that three doses is what's expected. I think that might encourage people a little bit more. So, you know, and then I think finally, maybe having some more incentives, something along that line could maybe help getting more people vaccinated. I've suggested the province should have a bit of a tax cut. You get a discount on your health premiums if you get vaccinated because you've done something to protect the health of everybody else in the province. But some kind of incentive I think would help people you know, feel the nudge to go get vaccinated. I think there's a lot of people out there who support vaccination, they're willing to get vaccinated, but it's just not top of mind for them. It's not the most important thing they need to do. They have other things going on in their life. So they're just not getting around to it. And if you give an incentive, that might be what pushes them over to actually go out and get it more quickly. 
Yeah, and I think that in itself will be a study at one point. What actually really incentivizes people to make certain choices and not others. Um, one of our attendees is asking, what is the guide for the fourth dose for 60 plus? Is it like 90 days, 140 days, 180 days? And if you could spend a minute on that, that would be great. Yeah, so recommendation from the National Advisory Committee Organizations is 80 plus are recommended to get it in six months after their second dose. Ontario has given a slightly broader eligibility. So not necessarily strongly recommended for them, but they're able to get it, which means anybody 60 enough and they can get it as early as 84 days after their second dose. So that's, you know, uh, 12 weeks after the second dose, which is approximately three months. So 60 and up, you're able to get it anytime after 84 days, but the group who's really recommended is 80 plus and they're recommended to get it after six months. Thank you. Um, I'm switching over a little bit to questions that have come forward from a number of employers when it comes to self-isolation. And this is where it's really a gray zone for so many individuals. So the Ontario province uh, currently recommends five days of self-isolation um, to be in place, but as previously recommended 10, um, and some jurisdictions still in the world are doing so, but overall in Ontario and Niagara's indicates and recommends the five days of self isolation. What would you recommend for employers who want to maximize worker safety? And here is where uh, it likely is where the difficulty comes in. Uh, some people are having isolating because of someone else in the household, or some people are isolating because they're the first ones to have it, but then one of their children or another member of the household receives it when they're already at day three or four, ready to go back to work in two days while still having another member of the household having it. So it has created a lot of confusion and employers, I think for the most part, and the majority of employers have tried to create a very safe workplace and follow the guidelines that are there. What are your recommendations when it comes to those protocols? Yeah, so I don't think the five days is really a science-based number. I think it was brought in perhaps uh, in some concern that too many people were having to isolate and trying to correct for that. And I think the flip side of that is now we have people coming back to work or school when they're still infectious. Unfortunately, it's leading to more people being off. I'm not sure it really has worked out well. If we look at the science, the peak infectivity is between days three to six. So you are still at your peak of infection if you go back in day six, um, and it, you remain infectious for probably close to about 10 days. So I would still stick to closer to a 10 day isolation. The alternate is if you wanna do a five day isolation, recommend people do a rapid test and have a negative rapid test. And if they have a negative rapid test, that means that they're over their infection and it's good for them to come back. If they still have symptoms, they still have a positive rapid test after that five days, they should stay off until their symptoms are gone and they get a negative rapid test up to 10 days. And I think once you're at 10 days, you know, your risk is gonna be low enough that you can come back. So that would be my best advice. And that's actually what we are currently practicing within public health to try and have a little bit higher margin of safety. It gets difficult, I know, when you have family members who are isolating and you're isolating and unfortunately all those times then add up. My best advice is, as best as possible, try and isolate away from the people in your household who have infection and try to think about some of those ventilation filtration things I talked about. We're fortunately, you know, hopefully going to get into warmer weather this weekend, maybe wasn't so much. But as we do, you can actually keep windows open, which is going to improve the ventilation in your home and hopefully keep people safer. Um, try and keep the HVAC system running continuously. That's going to keep the air circulating, going through the filter. That's going to remove virus. So you lessen the risk that other people in the home are going to get infected. If you want to buy a small air purifier or a small portable HVAC uh, device and run that, that's another way you can filter the air to make sure it's going to be safer in the home and reduce the chance that infection is going to spread. And of course, keeping the person who are people who are sick, I, taking to one room so not around others is the other part of that. And the difficulty with this is actually that people roughly, I think it was the Harvard Medical School that had indicated that about one or two days before anyone starts developing symptoms, they're already contagious. And then if we add that time on top of it, it is significant um, for yeah. individuals, significant for uh, employers, and I can see where the dilemma comes forward in this one. Um, it, it's it's really hard, and I think you're right that we have to actually start looking at alternatives 
and ensuring airflow, fresh air, and other aspects of masking, anything else that we can do to actually avoid this as we're moving forward. But it makes sense. We got a high number of questions, but I think you've addressed them all related to the mask mandate uh, that is there. Another individual, um, Tim, has asked if there are other variants or outbreaks uh, that are there um, that we need to be concerned about. There's always new variants emerging. Um, most of them aren't really of concern. So right now there's no new variant that's a particular concern that the World Health Organization has highlighted as such a variant. Um, it could happen anytime though, so we'll keep watching. But the good news is for now, we just need to worry about this BA2 subvariant of Omicron. And could you also expand on this new antiviral drug for treatment of COVID-19 uh, as being an option of possibly helping individuals? It has been indicated was uh, permitted and uh, by the um, federal government early in this year, in January, and now Ontario has announced also uh, assessment and testing um, around this. Could you expand on that as this might be an option that people are looking for? Yeah, and there's actually two different antivirals we can use. Paxovid is the one that's recently approved that everybody knows about. It's a pill form, five pills you take over the course of five days, I think. And then the other one is remdesivir, which is unfortunately an IV medication, but it is still an option to help reduce people being hospitalized. And the idea is that if you take someone who's higher risk of being hospitalized and they get either one of these medications, it drastically reduces their risk of being hospitalized complicated to actually identify who is eligible for it. A lot of the time, the people who are high risk also have lots of medical issues that are on many medications. This drug interacts with your other medications. So there need to be lots of changes to your medications. Key thing I think everybody should know about this is that these medications only work within the first few days of you becoming sick. And often people, you get COVID-19, you're actually not too well, bad off. It feels like a cold. And four, five, six days later, now you're feeling really sick. And once you're at that point, it's too late to, for these medications to work. So the key thing is if you are, think you're high risk because you're older, you know, older than the age 50, 60 year old, you have underlying medical conditions, maybe you're someone who's chosen not to be vaccinated, call up your doctor as soon as you get any mild symptoms of illness so you can find out if you're eligible for these medications and get those medications as early as possible so you can get the protection when it's actually gonna do benefit. What the Ontario government has tried to do, because very little of this medication went out in January, February, or March, is now try and make it much more available. So primary care can prescribe it, pharmacies can give it to you. You don't have to go to a central assessment center anymore to go get these medications, and hopefully that's going to work out. Key thing is, though, reach out to your primary care provider as soon as you have symptoms if you think you're someone who's at higher risk. And there's a question that's coming in. Do, we, do people and individuals need a prescription uh, to access those um, medications. Yeah, you will need a prescription yeah. to access these medications. I, I thought so too. And one last question, as time permits, is for our rapid tests. Uh, there is one of our attendees is saying, and we have heard and read about stories similar to that, that the rapid test often after five or 10 days um, and often for weeks and months after that still indicates um, that they are positive for COVID-19. And then they are coming back, the employer is asking them to come back into the workplace and that might create the sense that other employees are not as safe. Are they still infectious at that time or can you shed some clarity? And I know you've already mentioned um, the certainty and, and of the test itself um, and it is not 100% sure, but maybe a PCR test would be the answer at that time. Uh, yeah, PCR test might be an option, but you may not be actually eligible to get it because there is, you know, who's eligible to get those is so restricted. Um, you know, rapid tests very rarely seem to remain positive for a long period of time in people. PCR tests absolutely do for weeks and weeks afterwards, but rapid tests generally tend to taper off pretty quickly, which is why I recommended that after five days isolation, if your symptoms are gone, do that rapid test. And once it's negative, you know for sure you're safe to go back because in most cases it should go to negative. If you are within that five to 10 day period and the rapid test is still positive, I think that's a pretty good sign you are still infectious. You still don't want to come back to work. Once you're at day 10, if you've done 10 days of isolation, you don't have any symptoms, 
and that rapid test is still positive, I wouldn't be too concerned about that person coming back to work at that point. By that point, they're probably no longer infectious and for some reason that rapid test is just ending up positive in them. Um, key thing is though, some people will still have symptoms past 10 days. If they do, that's a reason they need to stay isolated until their symptoms definitely go away. And for that day five to day 10, definitely stay on isolation if you're testing positive on the rapid test. Excellent. And with that, we actually have to wrap up the hour again. It goes by so quickly. So thank you, Dr. Hoji, for being with us uh, today. And uh, I know that one of my colleagues has actually shared some information about the rapid antigen test kits uh, that are available uh, for distribution. So if you have any questions um, or might have missed the link, just uh, please feel free to connect with us directly. Today's webinar, as always, has been recorded and will be available on our website at gncc.ca and it will be emailed to all participants. So thank you very much uh, for being with us. Stay safe and uh, support your local businesses. Thank you.